Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MPARC's One Million Trees webinar. Happy Deepavali to everyone here today. Today's session will be all about seeds and saplings and how we are nurturing the next one million trees. My name is Bo Sing, and I'll be your host for this afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on YouTube and also on Zoom. We are well into our One Million Trees movement, where we aim to plant a million trees across Singapore over the next few years, the next 10 years. We have already planted more than 80,000 trees since the movement started in April, and that is thanks to the effort of many individuals, groups, and organizations from across Singapore. We have all participated and contributed to our vision of making Singapore a city in nature. We are very eager to share with everyone more about the One Million Trees movement through events like this one. So do look out for our updates on our website, Trees SG, and also and park social media channels. My colleague Zestin will be sharing the links shortly in the Zoom chat. So let me introduce our speakers for today. If plant seeds were currency, our first speaker, he will be Singapore's richest man. But that's because he runs Singapore's only seed bank. You might find him a bit familiar from the old grandfather story video on YouTube. He is none other than Mr. Ang Wee Fong, Deputy Director of Nursery Management and Native Plant Center. Our second speaker, he is Anne Park's resident palm expert, but today he'll be switching camps and talking about trees instead. He is Mr. Zaki Jamil, Officer at Native Plant Center. And the both of them will be answering an important question. Where do all these 1 million trees that we intend to plant be coming from? Just a spoiler alert, you'll get a sneak peek at M Park's largest nursery and also the people behind it. And of course, not forgetting the trees that are being grown there. So in our last webinar, we shared about tree planting throughout Singapore's history and how we'll be planting 1 million trees moving forward. We have been hard at work planting these trees across Singapore with the community. But all of this would not be possible without Weifong, Zaki and their team. They have been working hard behind the scenes nurturing these saplings. And today, Weifong will be sharing about how nurseries such as Ann Park's Pasir Panjang Nursery support this nationwide effort to further integrate nature into our urban landscape. Afterwards, Zaki will be sharing more about the species that are propagated at the nursery and how we have carefully selected them to aid us in our effort to transform Singapore into a city in nature. If you do have any questions along the way, please send them to Zestin using a private message to the Zoom chat. We'll try to share some of these during the Q&A later before we wrap up. I hope you're as excited as I am to start. We form, please. All right, thanks for seeing for the very generous introduction. Uh, uh, of myself. Uh, so once again, uh, I'm Wee Fong. Uh, so uh, Zaki and I, uh, we are actually from uh, Pasmacha Nursery uh, and also the Native Plant Center. So um, this is where um, the, I mean, in, in MPAC, this is where we actually propagate uh, most, most and all of our trees and our shrubs and climbers and all sorts of things uh, that you see along some uh, along our roadsides uh, when you go to botanic gardens, when you go to our parks, uh, and even our nature reserve when we do reforestation, where we actually uh, do some enhancement work uh, at some of the forest patches. So um, today, uh, what uh, what Zaki and I will be bringing you through will be uh, some of the things that we do in the nursery, and later on, Zaki will share some of these interesting species uh, that we are planting and growing in the nursery. Okay, so you might. Uh, probably uh, wonder where in Singapore is Pasir Panjang Nursery. Uh, okay, so it's a no-brainer. It's at Pasir Panjang. Uh, okay, I'll show you right away. So if you can see, uh, so this is a map of Singapore. So Pasir Panjang is at the southwest uh, area of uh, Singapore, somewhere near uh, Vivo City. So okay, right here, you can see uh, this red uh, uh, circle area. So that's Pasir Panjang Nursery. So we are nestled uh, amongst the whole southern ridges. So uh, southern ridges is actually uh, a series of parks uh, ranging from Mount Faber to Teluk Blanga to Hot Park and then to Cambridge Park. Uh, and it, you can actually go through this whole area uh, seamlessly. So if you do um, take this whole 
uh, trail or this track, uh, you will pass by one of these treetop walks uh, at uh, Kenridge Park and you will be able to, and there's a small little window where you can actually look into the nursery. So, yeah, so this is uh, an aerial view of, uh, uh, of the nursery. So this is Pats Pajar Nursery. So Hot Park is just to the right of us. So um, if you go through Hot Park, um, you enter from Hy uh, Hyderabad Road, you walk through the whole of Hot Park uh, until the end, you'll see uh, some of the Gardens by the Bay prototype houses. And beyond that, uh, before you actually go into Kenridge Park, you see this gate. Uh, and so this gate is actually where Pasar Panjang Nursery is. So uh, Pasar Panjang Nursery is about uh, the size of uh, 16 football fields. Uh, so there's 16 hectares. Uh, and in Pasar Panjang Nursery, we have uh, more than 2,000 uh, species and varieties of plants. And we actually uh, hold more than uh, 400,000 numbers of plants uh, at any one point of time. So, but do you know that actually Pasar Panjang Nursery used to be much bigger? So, uh, so this is a, this a, a snapple fact. So Pasar Panjang Nursery used to extend all the way to uh, the front of Hot Park, but half of uh, the nursery was cut out uh, and uh, into Hot Park. And this is where we, uh, the nursery actually shows and displays uh, some of our interesting uh, and new plants that we actually propagate uh, in uh, the nursery. So think of, Hot Park as like uh, the car show room uh, of uh, the nursery. So this is where we showcase some of these new and interesting things. So, so this is an aerial view of uh, the nursery. You'll be able to see uh, like uh, this uh, black dot uh, or this black uh, 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 shape here. So this is actually the pond. So this is the irrigation pond where we actually collect water for uh, watering our plants and also another secondary pond at the end of the nursery uh, and this is where we collect rainwater. So um, Pasar Panjang Nursery is actually, uh, it's actually nestled uh, at a valley area where on the south side you can see it's actually Kenridge Park and on the north side of uh, the nursery is actually uh, Hyderabad Road area where we have uh, the black and white uh, bungalow houses uh, and so all these are actually slopes uh, and uh, grassland. So for those of you all who, uh, who, are, who are married and who have probably taken some of your wedding photo shoots there, you might be familiar with this place. So uh, it, uh, it's actually quite popular for wedding photo shoots uh, with the nice grassland and black white houses uh, uh, at the background. So, so with Pasar Pajang Nursery nestled at the valley, we are actually very fortunate to have um, all the surface runoff for water actually flowing down into the nursery. So this is where we collect uh, the rainwater and also groundwater and also surface runoff for watering our plants. So this is a schematic view of the nursery. And in the nursery, we actually grow uh, many, many, many different types of uh, plants and, uh, and of different habits. So uh, you can see that uh, uh, we have uh, palms, bougainvilleas, shrubs and fruit trees in one whole area. So we have a shade house that uh, actually houses all our uh, uh, shrubs that actually require uh, some shade. Uh, we have uh, a full sun area where we actually grow some of the edible plants and aquatic plants. Uh, another area that actually houses the uh, climbers and ground covers. Uh, we also have uh, the National Orchid Garden Nursery within uh, uh, the uh, within Pasar Nursery itself. So the uh, kids here. Uh, we have the Native Plant Center uh, towards the end, and this is where uh, many of uh, the native plants that are endangered, uh, rare, uh, and uh, endemic to Singapore are propagated. And you can see the trees actually take up a very, very large area in the nursery, yeah, because we actually propagate lots of trees, and trees, they also need uh, lots of space to grow. So uh, later I will show you how the trees are arranged, and uh, how, how trees are arranged and also uh, stored in the nursery. So in the nursery, uh, we have uh, a propagation area. So this propagation area is where we actually uh, do some of the soil mixing. So this is uh, the, the potting area for, uh, for the propagation house uh, in nursery. So this is where we actually have uh, different um, soil media. So we have some of the loamy soil. 
uh, we also have some of the uh, soil that is rich in organic matter. Uh, we also sometimes will use sand, we'll use vermiculite, and we'll use perlite. So the, the purpose of mixing uh, different uh, soil mixture or uh, different soil, uh, uh, yeah, different, different kind of soil mixture is because different plants, they need different kind of uh, conditions and uh, soil media to grow well. So uh, there's no one broad stroke kind of soil media that works for everything. So before we actually propagate the plants, we actually grow the plants, what we need to do is we need to understand uh, what plants we are growing. And this is then we know uh, uh, where we work out what the kind of conditions that they need. So some plants like typically, like some of the plants that grow in coastal areas, uh, they tend to grow in very well draining soil. They don't get uh, too much water. Uh, so they don't like soil uh, that are uh, actually waterlogged. Uh, whereas for plants that grow in freshwater swamp forests, they like their soil to be uh, to, to be waterlogged, to hold water so that they actually can grow well. So depending on different types of plants, we will mix the soil accordingly. And at this area is also where we actually propagate our seeds and cuttings. So you can see some of these trays here. So this is where we actually sow some of the seeds uh, in a uh, mixture of sand and cocoa peat. So once the seeds uh, and stem cuttings are sown inside these trays, they are then moved into uh, what we call a mist house. So the mist house is where we actually let uh, some of these uh, 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 seeds and uh, cuttings actually take root. Uh, and this is where uh, in the mist house, we actually have these uh, mister sprinklers. So they are switched on every hour for about 15 minutes. So they help to both water the plants and also keep the air humid. So uh, it's important to keep the air humid because uh, some of, for example, some of the cuttings, uh, they have not grown roots yet. And if the air is too dry, uh, what happens to the cuttings is that they tend to dry out before even they start to grow roots. So this is where we actually uh, allow the seeds and the cuttings to actually uh, establish uh, themselves here. Uh, and you can see some, although some, uh, you can see some of these plants over here, they, too, they tend to have a bit of brown uh, leaves, but this is because in the mist house is also where we do some of our uh, transplanting works, where we actually uh, actually transplant some of uh, the, the plants from smaller pots into bigger pots, and in the process, sometimes the roots are damaged, they, they tend to actually, uh, the leaves dry, uh, dry a bit. But in the mist house, this is where they can recover, and this is where we actually put in some of plants uh, after transplantation in to actually uh, help them recover and get back uh, on shape. So after the plants have established themselves uh, or taken root or germinated in the mist house, they're then moved into a hardening area. So in this hardening area, what you can see uh, over here are uh, actually uh, small little plant saplings or seedlings. They are in their individual pots or individual bags. Uh, and this is to allow them uh, to have enough root space to grow. So in the hardening house, this is where uh, the plants are no longer uh, given uh, the misting, uh, no longer given humid air, uh, so it's no longer that comfortable. Uh, and they are placed under a uh, semi-shaded area and they're exposed to the weather elements outside now. So this is where the plants will then uh, slowly grow and also acclimatize themselves to the outdoor conditions. So that's why we call this a hardening area. And you realize that they are actually placed on uh, pellets. So these pellets actually help us a lot in the nursery because with a nursery that's about 16 hectares or 16 or the size of 16 football fields, uh, it is no joke trying to move the plants from one area to another area. So being on pellets help us uh, to actually uh, do, this pro uh, do, do this process uh, efficiently to actually organize uh, our plant stock in different areas uh, more efficiently and in a fast manner. So uh, like I was mentioning to you, so um, that we have an irrigation pond in the nursery. So this is the irrigation pond that I was talking about. Uh, it's a very, very nice view, very nice scenery. Sometimes when uh, we are stressed at work, uh, when we'll come to this pond, just take a break, look at the view, and it's a very nice greenery behind. So that's Cambridge Park uh, uh, on the top. You can see this little uh, hill or little mound. Um, and so this is the pond, uh, irrigation pond. We collect rainwater, uh, surface runoff, and also groundwater. 
uh, over here, you see this little white building here. So this is the pump house. The pump house, um, we have, uh, the pump house has five pumps which uh, rotate uh, in the operations. Uh, and this is to actually supply water to all parts of the nursery. So uh, imagine this pond that we collect uh, rainwater for, uh, for irrigation actually supplies to about 16 hectares uh, of uh, plants uh, all in the nursery. So uh, I got a view to show, uh, uh, yeah, a, small, a short video to show you how the plants are being uh, watered in the nursery. So you can see, so this is the trees area. Uh, so this is where we actually house all the trees in rows. Uh, they are arranged neatly according to species. Uh, and you can see that uh, we have, and because there are so many trees around and there are so many, uh, and they are of different heights. So we need to water them one by one. Uh, and, you know, and we can't uh, have people watering uh, back by back or pot by pot. Uh, so that's why we have these kind of sprinklers. They actually throw the water around. So any surface runoff from uh, the irrigation actually channels themselves back. Uh, ch the water is channeled back into the irrigation pond. So nothing is wasted. Oops, sorry. Let me, okay, let me move to the next slide. All right, so this is just a glimpse of uh, what we have in the nursery. So I touched on the mist house and the hardening house. And some areas and some views that you see in the nursery are uh, below here, where you can see some of the shade houses uh, where we actually have uh, some of our uh, plants that actually require uh, semi-shade to grow well. Some of the full sun areas uh, and some of the, yeah, and some of the areas we, which we have uh, covered uh, a covered shelter and so th this is the control watering so some plants do not like uh, constant watering and they only like uh, watering when as and when the soil is dry so this is where we do control watering so this is a fusan area where we usually grow uh, some of our shrubs uh, and some of our uh, uh, food um, yeah some of the shrubs that like uh, lots of sun like some of the bamboo orchids and some of these uh, camellias uh, that we actually grow in the nursery. We do have some of the aquatic plants, uh, so some of you might be familiar and spotted this uh, lotus. We also have some of the Amazon swap plants, uh, water lilies, uh, and we also do have mangrove, uh, mangrove trees that are also grow in fresh water, which we propagate uh, from propagules that are collected uh, around the mangroves in Singapore. We also have a shade house, so uh, that actually houses some of these uh, shade plants and each of these shade houses are uh, actually fitted with uh, all these uh, plant racks so these plant racks are actually uh, used uh, are actually specially designed for the um, for the shade houses as they help to optimize the space uh, in the shade house so you can see uh, like just like our hdb flats you know uh, we in for singapore we do not have um, lots of land space, but what we do is we utilize the vertical space. So these plant racks help to utilize the vertical space where uh, other than just putting the plants on the normal uh, platform rack, uh, we also can put some of the plants that require more shade below the racks. And we have this structure over the racks to, uh, for some of the plants to hang. Uh, so we can hang some of these uh, like pitcher plants and some of these uh, lipstick plants uh, on the hangers itself. Uh, these frames also help to also provide another function. You can see that there's a shade net over uh, this, um, this plant rack here. So this actually provides a customized shade level for plants that may possibly need uh, more shade than what the general shade house can provide. Yeah, so this allows some customizations. And these, uh, sorry, these uh, plant racks, they're also on roller wheels. So what happens is uh, it's, like a, it's like an archive uh, compressor shelf shelving system, so you can actually move the racks, uh, uh, move the racks uh, left to right, so as to widen the aisle in between the racks uh, for moving the plants around. So this helps to save space as well in the nursery. Uh, we have a uh, an area where we actually uh, store the trees. So usually the trees are arranged in neat rows. Uh, so some of them are, um, so some of these trees we are actually trying to prime them for. Uh, uh, for planting. So we actually have uh, some of these uh, individual irrigation tubes for some of these trees. 
uh, while some of the trees, uh, we actually have the sprinkler system. So just to give you a glimpse of uh, the, extent, uh, the, the extent of trees we have in the nursery, uh, I've taken a video. So this is a buggy ride video uh, of the trees area in the nursery. Okay, so you can see uh, we do have quite a lot of trees in uh, the nursery. So the trees are arranged in neat rows uh, along uh, the sides. So you can see some of these white posts on the right side of uh, the video. So each of these posts are numbered. Uh, so this gives us uh, the rough location of where the trees are. So in the nursery, we propagate uh, all sorts of trees, uh, native trees, uh, ornamental trees, trees that actually uh, attract biodiversity, uh, trees that actually uh, produce fragrant flowers, and also trees that, uh, that actually produce edible fruits. And not just the edible fruits that we're familiar with, but also the wild relatives of uh, some of these fruits uh, that we commonly eat. Like for example, like uh, if you're familiar with mangosteen that we normally eat, but do you know that there are many, many and several other species of mangosteens that are also found in the forest. And uh, some of these are also eaten by the indigenous people, uh, like for example, in Brunei, in Sarawak and Sabah. Uh, yeah, so, and many of these fruits are actually quite interesting in that taste. So as you can see, so this is uh, about a 400 meter stretch um, of trees. So as we're going down the slope, okay, so this is the far, the far end of the nursery where we have a secondary irrigation pond. So I just want to show you uh, this area on the left side. So this is where we actually uh, house some of our larger trees. So some of the larger trees are much taller, so they require a taller support. So these support systems actually are, they're, they're made of stainless steel uh, and they actually help to actually support the trees uh, because of their size. Yeah. Okay, I'll just stop right there. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so you might, uh, you might possibly wonder, so what goes on in the daily life of uh, a nursery staff? So, well, uh, what a typical day uh, for the nursery staff would be that we would go out into, we we'll go to some of the habitats uh, around in Singapore. So, uh, through, through, um, through this work uh, in the nursery, I've actually been to uh, quite a lot of different places in uh, Singapore and I actually have the uh, fortune to actually go to these places, like for example, like the mangrove forest. So this is a very nice mangrove forest with a sandy shore. Uh, while some mango forests, they tend to be very uh, muddy uh, and very soft mud. And when you go inside uh, the mango swamp just to collect some of these propagules, you tend to sink if you're not careful. Um, there are also uh, swamp forests uh, in the inland areas of uh, inland forests of Singapore. So you also go to uh, freshwater swamp forests uh, to actually collect some of these species. Uh, there are also sometimes where um, the landing or uh, the areas are not so easy to access. So this is one of the southern islands where we actually do some uh, collection of some of our native coastal plants uh, and also uh, do a biodiversity survey of uh, what, uh, what, what was found in some of our southern islands. Well, sometimes uh, the field work is much easier. Uh, we do have a clear path and nice lawn to walk, to walk on. So these are some of the places that we go uh, around in Singapore just to collect uh, the fruits, uh, the seeds. And sometimes even if the plants are not fruiting uh, or they do not, we do not get any seeds, uh, we also try to collect some cuttings uh, to actually uh, try to propagate them. So in the nursery, one of the things that uh, we do also is uh, other than trying to uh, germinate and propagate some of these things, we also document how uh, each of these plants can be propagated. Yeah, so uh, these are some, just some of the few work photos to give you a glimpse of what we do uh, uh, um, on a normal basis. So these photos were taken before uh, COVID-19. So you can see our, of our smiley fa smiling faces. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, so typically we go to the forest uh, and sometimes uh, the paths are not easy. Sometimes we have to uh, climb up some slopes uh, after you climb out the slope, you, have to, you also have to climb down the slope. So yeah, 
and sometimes we have to walk on uh make our way through some rocky shores. Uh, we have to watch the tight level so that um we can get back uh safely to the boat on time, uh before the high tide comes. So yeah, so this is one of the southern islands where we have to take uh a small uh, a smaller boat just to do a landing. And sorry. And most of the time, uh, if you see this photo on the left side here, the bottom left, so this is uh, what happens most of the time after a few work. We'll go back with bags of uh, plant material, be it seeds, fruits, uh, some cuttings, and sometimes even uh, seedlings or wildings that we actually collect from the forest. And this is to go back to, uh, to bring back to the nursery for propagation. So it's, you know, it's really like, uh, so you know, we just had uh, the 11-11 sale, right? So this is, uh, every time we go in the field, it's almost like a yeah eleven so that go back with uh bags of plants and propagation material to actually uh grow. <clears throat> so, um, sometimes uh the sometimes collecting of seeds are easy. Uh, just need to pick them uh off the ground uh, and put them in a the bag. Uh, sometimes it's not so easy. You have to actually balance uh yourself on uh some footing uh with a pole pruner just to reach for some. Uh, some of the fruits and the seeds. But um, do remember um, uh, to leave the fruits and seeds for us because we need them to propagate the next generations of trees and shrubs for Singapore. So do not pick uh, the fruits and seeds uh, from the uh, forest or from the roadside trees or parts when you see them. Uh, leave them to us. We, we need them for our propagation. So typically this is what happens when we get back to the nursery. With a lot, with more things that we have collected, there are more sorting, uh, more plant sorting to go through. Uh, so other than sorting out the seeds and the fruits that are collected, we also need to sort out the plants, uh, <clears throat> um, the, the the cuttings to get a voucher specimen, to get them ID as well. So some of the sometimes uh, the common things that we have collected, uh, the first the, or the species that we're familiar with, we will be able to ID them, but for many times. There are some things that we are not able to ID. That's where uh, these plant uh, vouchers or specimens actually come in handy uh, when we send it to the herbarium, where we work with our colleagues from the, from the botanic gardens to ID some of these plants. So plants can be propagated from seeds or fruits, uh, from cuttings, or sometimes what we do is we do air layering. So this is where we actually uh, do some of these uh, marcotting work by putting sphagnum moss around, wrapping it around uh the uh the stem uh, or the branch just to uh encourage the stem to root and sometimes we bag uh the fruits to collect the seeds so you don't miss them and after we propagate them this is how typically uh some uh yeah some of these scenes uh in the nursery you you'll see like you get some of these uh seedlings that have germinated in the individual cups or pots and sometimes uh there are cuttings uh inside sand uh, and we're waiting for them to root. And usually after several weeks or months, they will uh, grow up to about 30 cm tall uh, or about uh, a foot tall or sometimes 50 cm tall. And this is when we will then need to <clears throat> start to let, uh, start to transplant them into bigger bags so that this allows them more root space for them to grow into bigger plants. And then that's where we actually arrange them uh, in neat rows uh, for our plant, uh, for our colleagues to actually come to the nursery to pick them up for planting. <clears throat> so this is typically how it looks like. And for the big trees, we actually uh, tie them to, uh, secure them to the metal structure, the poles, so that uh, they don't fall over. So typically our colleagues from uh, the operations unit, such as uh, parks, streetscapes, uh, nature reserve, botanic gardens, they'll come to the nursery with uh, their, their lorries just to pick up some plants. So typically they'll come with a crane lorry and they will just tie the plants that they want. Uh, and the crane lorry will hoist these plants up uh, onto the lorry and then they move off. For some of the plants that are smaller than easier to actually pick up, they will just uh, you know just carry out and just load them to the lorry. So typically this is how it looks like. Yeah, uh, a lorry full of plants just to actually uh, go out for planting. And so you might think that uh the the the, the nursery uh the nursery guys uh, 
are just like you know going around propagating things, uh, collect, collecting and propagating things. Uh, but that's not just the only thing that we do. So we do uh, actually uh, conduct some of these outreach activities. Uh, uh, previously in the festival, festival of biodiversity, we actually brought out some of these plants uh, and we showed to the public uh, on some of these native plants that could be found in our forest. Uh, we also uh, did some, uh, some of these outreach activities with some of our volunteers uh, to actually do collection of seeds uh, and uh, guided walks uh, of uh, places. And we also uh, do some of these, uh, we also support the rest of uh, MPARCs uh, in events and activities such as uh, garden festivals and things like that, where we also actually provide plants uh, for the festival, for like displays or for planting. Yeah, so I hope that that gives you a small glimpse of uh, what we do in the nursery. Uh, yeah, and hope that you have uh, uh, got a better understanding of what we do here. Uh, but if you uh, have joined us halfway through and missed out some of the, uh, the things I've touched about, uh, you can actually uh, go to our uh, YouTube channel and watch uh, the video uh, where Zaki uh, actually gave an introduction of the nursery. Okay, over to you, Bosin. Thank you, Weifong, for that very interesting look into vital operations supporting the One Million Trees movement, and also the great lengths at which you guys go to to just get plant materials. Now that our curiosity about where all these trees are coming from has been satisfied, I'm sure everyone's curious about the species that we are propagating for the One Million Trees movement. Zaki will be sharing that with us, and as Weifong has introduced, he has a very interesting video giving you a virtual, virtual tour of the Pasir Panjang Nursery. So you might want to check it out after this session. Just a reminder, if you have further any questions, do submit them through the Zoom chat to Zestin. Without further ado, Zaki, please. Thank you, Bo Ching, uh, Zaki, and I'll be sharing with you the interesting species of trees and palms that we grow in the nursery. Most of the species I'll be sharing with you are native to this region. Some are native to Singapore and they can be found along our roadsides, parks and gardens. Let's start with the first one is the Berlian or the Bonio Ironwood. Um, um, cinnamon avocado, Berlian tree is extremely slow growing. Its, wood is, its timber is one of the hardest in the world. Uh, as it's durable and heavy, uh, mainly used in uh, marine construction such as building the ships and wharves. The indigenous people of uh, Borneo, the Dayak people, they use the wood to build the traditional houses like the long houses. As you can see over here, these pictures were taken in Sarawak by our colleague. Those wood you see there, those uh, brilliant wood and Apart from its fallible wood, I think this tree has its ornamental values too. Um, the new leaves, uh, sorry, the, the leaves are glossy and green, which, and that's pretty ornamental, I find. Um, the second picture shows the fruit. It is the size of a mango fruit, and that's the sapling that we have in the nursery. And do you know that this uh, tree is the official national tree of Sarawak? You can find this tree growing in the Botanical Gardens of Singapore and uh, Mount Faber Park. Moving on to the next one is the um, Sengkuang or the Pacific Walnut, a close relative to the mango and cashew nut. Um, this handsome tree is native and is uh, appreciated for its distinctive uh, characteristics such as its round canopy, leaves and trunk. The tree in this particular photo you can it's located at the entrance of Hall Park, so you can't miss it when you visit the park. The tree produces little cream white flowers. They are born in large inflorescence or flower stalks, lightly fragrant. Its fruits are the size of a ping pong ball and they are very sour, eaten in certain, eaten in certain parts of Malaysia. Those are the saplings that we have at the nursery. They are about a year and a half old. They are very, they, they are moderately fast growing trees. Moving on to the third one is the Terap or the um, Autocarpus elasticus. Um, this tree is native, can be found in our forests, uh, such as Bukit Batut Nature Reserves and Southern Ridges. Its cousins are the 
Chempedak and the jackfruit. Therop trees grows really tall, up to 45 meters tall, and the leaves are large and simple. The juveniles possess uh, deeply, as you can see here, uh, those are the saplings. So don't get confused if you see two types of leaves on a single tree. The second photo shows the mature branch of the tree with the adult leaves, which are simple, and the fruits. The fruits are creamy yellow and they are like super-sized rambutans. Uh, each fruit contains uh, many seeds inside, which are surrounded by white succulent arrows. The arrows are the flesh of the fruit and they are edible. I think it's quite creamy. I've tried it before. And mature trees have buttresses up to three meters tall. Uh, you can appreciate this uh, closely at Fort Canning Park. The next one is a bread nut. Bread nut is often mistaken as the breadfruit because of its almost similar appearance. It's deeply lobed leaves and the large fruits. Bread nut fruit contains many seeds inside which, uh, which are eaten in um, certain Asian countries like the Indonesia and Malaysia. And the young fruits can be cooked in curries, um, can be cooked in curries. As you can see here in the first picture, uh, it shows the seed of the bread nut. It's about two cm in diameter. And the middle photo shows the breadfruit as a, for comparison, as you can see the, the skin of the breadfruit is smooth and very rough and prickly like a puffer fish on the um, bread nut fruit. And this tree is cultivated for its beautiful leaves and form. You can find this tree growing at um, uh, Singapore Botanical Gardens. And the fifth tree comes from the nutmeg family. It's the Piangu. This tree is native and its local conservation status is critically endangered, which means that there are not many trees standing in the wild. Piangu tree, um, usually found in swampy areas. Um, this tree produces yellow flowers along its droopy branches. Those are the flowers. And the fruits start from green and then ripe to bright orange. And they split open to reveal its seeds. And the seeds are very attractive to our native uh, fauna, such as the oriental pied hornbill. As this tree adapts uh, well to the urban condition, it is increasingly um, a popular choice for roadside um, planting. You can find this tree at the um, along Yishun Avenue 1 and as well as the learning forest of Singapore Botanical Gardens. Also from the same family as the nutmeg and piangu uh, is the small small leaf nutmeg. Um, this tree is a, uh, is a coastal species, which means that they grow uh, naturally by the sea. You can find them growing abundantly in uh, Chek Jawa at Pulau Bin. The flowers are brown and hairy on the outside and creamy yellow in the inside, and they are produced along its droopy branches. That's the fruit of the small leaf nutmeg. Um, Pretty similar as the Piangu's fruits, except that the skin is bright yellow and the flesh is bright red, also um, eaten by the hornbills. They grow very easily from seed, and that shows the saplings that we have, that we grow in the nursery. They grow pretty fast. Yellow soraka. Yellow soraka is, is from the legume family. Um, the, species the species is named after a town in Malaysia, Taiping, where they were found growing. Uh, yellow soraka produces beautiful, bright, yellowy, orange flowers, and they are cauliflowers, which means that they appear along the branch and trunks. The flowers attract myriads of honey eaters like the sunbirds, the butterflies, and bees. As you can see, the, there's the carpenter bee indulging in the flowers of the soraka. The pots are wine colored and they split open to reveal its seeds for dispersal. And I think that um, even when not in flower, I think the tree is quite ornamental because um, the new flushes are purple and um, hang down like handkerchiefs. And sometimes in Malaysia, um, the root and the wood of the Soraka tree used to make handles of parangs. The next one is the Rosak Irian, comes from the Ditrocapesi, from the Ditrocap family. Rusak irian is a mid mid canopy tree. Unlike its uh, unlike other genuses of the Ditrocarp pacey, they are mostly emergent. Um, Rusak irian trees, um, Rusak irian leaves are, are large and smooth, and there are lots all all of these dots you can see at the edge. They are bacterial glands, and that's one of the characteristics of um, 
or sub -Irian. The tree produces um, creamy flowers in large inflorescence, very showy, and they are lightly fragrant. As you can see here, all the, these are all the flowers. And unlike the fruit of uh, unlike the fruits of um, other the trocut species, Rasak Irian fruits are wingless. As the tree naturally grows by the streams and rivers, they are dispersed by water. Next one is Bayur. Bayur is uh, related to durian and hibiscus. Unfortunately, it does not produce any edible fruits um, or showy flowers, but Bayur is um, cultivated for its beautiful contrasting foliage. Um, the upper surface is green and the lower surface is bronze. It is a very beautiful tree, especially on a windy day, as the wind reveals its um, colors underside. And that's the trunk of the bio tree. It kind of reminds me of the monitor lizard skin and also the snake skin. Moving on to the next one is the gas tree, um, also from the same family as the durian and hibiscus. hibiscus. This tree is a coastal species, native and presumed extinct in the wild. It is cultivated for its beautiful, lush green leaves and dainty pink flowers, which are produced at the end of the branches. The fruits are capsule, and each capsule um, contain, contains uh, one or two seeds inside. And some of you might be wondering why is it, it is called a gas tree. As this tree grows by the coast, by the sea, um, it acts like a like a welcoming sign to travelers who are, or visitors who are arriving to the island or the place. That's why it's called a gas tree. And the next one is one of my favorite trees. It's the Kananga odorata or the Ilang Ilang. Um, Ilang Ilang comes from the um, Sawasak family, Anonesi. The tree grows very fast and it has droopy branches. These trees here are located along Amokyo Avenue 8, just right next to the MRT track. So if you in the if you are in the area, please have a look. The flowers are valued. The ilang ilang flowers are valued. Sorry, the ilang ilang is valued for its fragrant flowers, which are very fragrant. They start as green and then change to yellow as they age. The flowers intense. The, the fragrant the fragrant intensifies um, after dark. This is to attract and guide night pollinators to pollinate the flowers. Those are the fruits of the ilang ilang. They are eaten by birds. And over there, over here is the sapling of the tree. The next one is the pelong tree. Pelong tree is one of the popular roadside trees we have here in Singapore. It is related to the mango and cashew nut. Um, pelong tree is deciduous, which means that they, they shed leaves during the dry spell to conserve water loss. And at the end of the dry spell, beautiful sprays of pink flowers are produced. Like this one, very beautiful. Um, you can find these trees growing along um, Kranji Expressway. And Pelong tree comes in white form too. And the next tree is the pink Evodia or the pink flowered doorwood. This tree is a popular roadside tree in Australia, but we are growing it in uh, Singapore. Uh, it has stunning pink flowers which are produced along its branches and the flowers are and the flowers attract myriads of honey eaters as well um, like the sunbirds and butterflies it is also called the pink flowered doorwood because its trunk is as pale as a block of dough and the leaves are trifoliate which means that they appear in trees and this tree is re related to orange and your curry leaf tree rutesi and the last tree that I'll be sharing with you is the Kaloa or the Kapayang. This tree is dramatic as it has a very large deep green leaves and the size of the tree is really majestic. And the seed of this uh, tree is used uh, in the famous Pranakan dish as the, like the uh, Ayam Bua Kaloa, as you can see here. And the fruits of this tree is almost the size of a rugby ball. It's really big about like this. And each fruit contains many seeds inside, about 20 seeds, and they are like they are clam shaped. And each seed is surrounded by custard yellow pulp. And the juveniles um, possess um, palmet leaves and they change to simple as they mature. Now, moving on to palms. Palms are used extensively in our landscapes for, for their bold features, um, colors, and texture. 
And the first palm that I'll be sharing with you is the Transfield's Elegant Palm. It is from Sabah and was only described in 2015. Transfield's Elegant Palm is named after the renowned palm specialist, Mr. John Transfield. That's me and him. Um, I was lucky enough to meet him back in 2018 and we, we exchanged lots of um, knowledge on palms. And there are also several other palms that name after him. So back to the palm, the palm, the fronts of these palms are grayish green in appearance and the trunk is white. And I think it's quite special for a Malaysian palm. You can find this tree, grow, uh, this palm growing at Palm Valley of Singapore Botanical Gardens. The next one is the Kalapa Palm or the Pinang Panawa. In Singapore, it is cultivated for its beautiful, elegant arched fronts. Those leaflets are neatly arranged and it is one of the fastest growing palms around. And apart from its uh, beautiful appearance, this palm has its ethno ethnobotanical uses too. In Indonesia, um, the, the seed of this palm is used as a substitute for, for betel nut. And it is believed that um, this palm has a magical significance and often can be seen growing together with the um, betel nut palm in villages. So you can see the betel nut palms behind and this one behind, uh, beside. And one, one interesting uh, thing that um, I was shared by Dr. John Transville that the seed of this palm is used in, um, sorry, in, in West Java, the seed of this palm, the parents would bury the seed of the palm together with a newborn placenta. And this tree acts like a sibling of the newborn. And I think that's quite a very sweet relationship um, between palm and um, human. Next one is the mangrove fan palm um, or palace. This tree, this palm is native, can be found in, in our coastal forest. Um, it is cultivated um, for its beautiful fan shaped fronds and in Malaysia, the, the leaves are used to, to wrap uh, glutinous rice cakes like the Ketupat Palas, you can see over here. Um, those are the berries which are eaten by birds, uh, very ornamental, especially in fruit. And that shows the wild palm in our forest. And the fourth palm is a Nibong palm. Nibong palm is native and uh, it is very tall and clustering. Nibong is valued for its wood, which is uh, drought, drought uh, resistant and also durable, mainly used in coastal construction, such as uh, build, building the kelongs back in the day. Um, the characteristics of a Nibong palm is the spiky trunk and the droopy leaflets. It's a very beautiful palm, especially on a windy day as the leaflets move in the wind, it's pretty mesmerizing. And the last palm that I'll be sharing with you is the Makados palm. Makados palm is from Peninsula Malaysia in Thailand. And unlike the other fan palms that we commonly, commonly see um, outside like the Saribus and the Livistona, Makados palm is more robust looking and they are very, it just looks full. And it is cultivated for its beautiful, enormous spidery fronds as you can see here. And this palm produces a very peculiar looking inflorescence. This, the whole thing is inflorescence and those uh, little flowers are the actual flowers. And the fruits of the Mankato's palm, they are like super-sized grapes and each fruit is about the size of a squash ball. And that's all for the, and that's all I have to, for, to share with you guys. And I hope you have uh, enjoyed this uh, introduction of the trees and palms that we grow at Pasir Pine Industry. Thank you, voting. Thank you very much, Zaki, for the very informative sharing and helping us to better appreciate and relate to the trees and palms that we'll be planting. I think we now have a better idea on what we are planting and also the hard work that goes behind producing these saplings. Now it's time for our Q&A session. Thank you to everyone in the audience who have submitted questions to us. We have an overwhelming response, so I apologize if you're not able to highlight every question. So for our first questions, um, directed to both Wee Fong and Zaki, what are some considerations when a species are selected for the OMT movement? 
All right, Zaki, you want to go first? <laughs> Uh, Zaki, I think you're on mute. It varies actually. Um, some trees, sorry. some uh, it varies actually because uh, some trees that uh, we we choose they are they provide shade and also um, wildlife and and aesthetic to to the um, yeah. So uh, okay. I think uh, so. There are, there are quite a few considerations that we <clears throat> that, that we have when we select trees for planting for OMT. So, uh, it's not just a broad stroke approach. Like uh, you know, like uh, every road we plant with rain trees and things like that. Uh, even though rain tree is quite characteristic uh, for some of our roads and it does provide very good shade. So there are some considerations. Uh, like for example, some roads, uh, we do plant them. Uh, and uh, or some of the parks. Uh, if you have followed us on uh, our Facebook and Instagram, sometimes you'll see uh, this SG flowering uh, post that we make. So some of these places are planted with, like for example, some of these plants that do mass blooming. So when it flowers, uh, the whole tree is covered with pink flowers, the whole crown, just pink or specials of white. Or sometimes when there are new leaves that actually emerge, the whole crown is red in color, very, very stunning. So uh, these uh, kind of planting actually also creates a certain kind of characteristic and look for certain roads and for certain parks. Uh, we do also have our nature ways uh, where we select trees that actually provide uh, uh, fruits and also uh, nectar or sometimes uh, even like uh, branches uh, for birds and uh, for birds to nest on uh, for the animals to feed on. So some of these trees uh, produce berries that are eaten by birds. Uh, and also the leaves are also uh, the host plants for some of our native butterflies as well. So there are many, many, many considerations for the trees that we choose. Uh, so it's not just a broad stroke approach for everything. And of course, for nature reserves, we will plant back uh, some of our uh, many of our native species and many of these are the endangered ones that we propagate in the nursery. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you for answering the question. Um, for our next question, I think um, the speak um, the audience wants to know how many tree species we have planted, and you know, do we do we actually how many do we actually plan to plant? All right, uh, Zaki, do you have a rough idea how many trees have you <laughs> how many different species have you planted so far? Um, actually, definitely over than uh, over than eighty species, honestly. Uh, most of the trees that we have introduced uh, to the streetscape of parks and gardens, they provide shade, uh, colors, and as well as um, provide um, habitat for wildlife. And yeah, about so far we have issued out about 80 species, over 80 species, yeah. And definitely there'll be more as yeah. we always keep, uh, as we always uh, introduce new species here at the nursery. I think for Zaki, because Zaki manages, uh, Zaki manages uh, uh, the native plant center, some of the native plants and also the palms in nursery. Uh, but in the larger nursery, we have, uh, okay, I would say we have uh, planted more than easily over hundreds of different species of trees uh, all around uh, Singapore, uh, ranging from young saplings, which we carry into the forest for reforestation, to big trees which are planted along the roadside. So um, we do have uh, different, um, different tree species that are meant for different areas. So uh, it's a very, very good question. So different, uh, so now uh, across Singapore, we have different parks uh, and different gardens. So what we do <coughs> is that we will curate uh, some of these plantings uh, to a certain team uh, and to uh, certain and for certain users, like for example, in some of our therapeutic gardens, uh, we do plant some of these trees that actually give off nice fragrance. So this will help people to relax when they go into the gardens. And uh, if you have been to, uh, to botanic gardens, to, uh, to the learning forest uh, at higher soil area, uh, you will notice that uh, many of these trees are our native freshwater swamp forest species. So this is to give the whole look uh, of uh, this habitat that, that we are that we are recreating uh, 
in Pyrosol or in the learning forest. So we do curate and plan uh, carefully some of these trees. And if you do go to, um, okay, this one I must highlight, uh, do go to Fort Canning Park as well to look at some of these plantings that uh, Bo Ching is looking after. So many of these trees are selected with historical and cultural significance and do take some time to notice some of these trees and read the storyboards that we have specially curated there in Fort Canning Park. That sounds like a, a lot of imp an impressive number of trees that are being planted. And I think there's more to come actually, if you guys um, the, in the audience are willing to put your hands and join us for more tree plantings, we can definitely plant a lot more diversity of tree species. All right, so for the third question, how long do saplings that are planted actually take to mature? Maybe we found you want to answer that. <laughs> All right. Okay. So it also varies from species to species. Um, so some 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 trees they do grow pretty fast. So within like um uh, within six months you should be able to get uh about a one meter tall tree. Sometimes for these fast growing species to be to be ready to be planted out. But some, <coughs> for example, um, okay, I'm not sure whether uh. Uh, everyone's familiar with, you know, the Berlin Jaw crackers that uh, you eat <clears throat> from uh, the market, I mean, you can buy from the market or, you know, it's this uh, like a potato chip kind of thing. Uh, it's made from this, uh, from a seed of uh, this native tree called uh, Nitem Niemann or Berlin Jaw. Uh, that seed itself already takes about six to nine months just for it to germinate. <laughs> so after, even after it germinates, after six to nine months, it takes uh, like quite, yeah, probably about a year plus just to get uh, the, the, the seedling to a plantable size that can be planted out in our parks and those sites. So uh, it, would, it would really differ um, quite a bit. So like for example, Berlin Jiao would probably take about like one and a half years to two years before you get a minimum size of about one meter tall to, to, to be ready to be planted out. Whereas some would be pretty fast, uh, maybe about like, uh, six months, you should be able to get a sizable plant to be planted up. Thank you for the response. And well, this person is very eager to you know join in and be part of the fun. So sorry. So how does one actually get to work in a nursery, and what causes are there to take? <laughs> All right. Uh. Okay. I will share from my personal experience, and maybe later Zaki uh, can share from his personal experience. Uh, about uh, how we came to work in Park. So <coughs> um, I studied in Singapore. Uh, I uh, studied life sciences uh, in NUS. And after I graduated, uh, yeah, I was looking around for a job. Uh, and actually, I quite like the greenery that uh, I see in Singapore. And I wanted to make, some, uh, make a contribution to the greenery, uh, to the place that I live in. So I applied for a job. <laughs> with M Parks. Uh, but my first job was not uh, the nursery. Uh, <clears throat> my first job was actually with uh, the plant info unit. So uh, we managed our four for web uh, for M Parks. And uh, later on, uh, uh, I, I was given a, the role or the task uh, to actually work in the nursery. Uh, so that's how I, 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 I moved from plant info unit to the nursery. So I studied life science. Uh, back in uni and yeah I was always interested in bio and uh, but I was never really interested in plants uh, since young uh, but I think later on I developed the interest when I studied more uh, in uni and, and got to appreciate the plants that uh, I was working on so maybe Zaki you can share from your experience like uh, where where and what do you study uh, and yeah Yeah, hi. I, I studied um, botany in Australia, so I, I've always um, I have always been into plants since I was a kid, um, and also um, and that's why I took um, course on botany. And after that, when I re came back to Singapore, um, we found <laughs> we we know we know we found uh, before because we were we were working on palms, and after that. Um, yeah, I, I recommended him to actually please apply for <laughs> the job. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I really enjoy what I'm doing right now, like because I I, I like to grow palms and I get to grow palms every day. Like we, we harvest the seeds from the nature reserve. Um, and then just to introduce and I like the I like how it works, like you know, 
like growing trees and watch them grow, um, I, I think it's, it feels really uh, satisfying. I think many people will want your number now, we form <laughs> to get a recommendation. And for our last question, um, does Pasir Panjang nursery include plants that are purchased from overseas? Uh, yes. Uh... Pasir Panjang Nursery, we do hold some of these plants that we have uh, purchased from overseas nurseries. Uh, and actually, this is how we also <clears throat> uh, increase the diversity of plants that we have uh, in the nursery and in Singapore that's available for planting. <clears throat> so, like for example, uh, some of these uh, trees that we see commonly around, like the rain tree, uh, so the rain tree is not native to Singapore. Uh, for for uh, for some for some people, it comes as a surprise because uh, we have seen rain trees since we we're young, uh, and they line the streets of Singapore all over. The rain tree is actually native to uh, the New World, to South America. Um, and from time to time, the nursery we do uh, purchase plants. Uh, we do get plants in from overseas to increase uh, the kind of diversity of plants that we plant around. Uh, in our parks, in our roadsides, in our gardens. And these are to actually help to uh, increase uh, the diversity and for uh, certain, curate certain types of planting. So if you're familiar with uh, this, uh, this very, very nice tree that we plant around uh, in our parks, uh, for example, the, the pink trumpet tree. So that's also uh, not native to this part of the world, uh, but we have uh, introduced it uh, some time back uh, and it actually helps to beautify the environment. Uh, but we do also, uh, are also planting lots of native plants uh, that are uh, native to Singapore, they are from our forest. And actually many of these native plants do also have very nice uh, features such as uh, the mempat tree, if you are familiar uh, with uh, this pink, also pink flowered uh, flowers, but the flowers are much smaller and they resemble, really resemble a cherry blossom flower. Um, this is native to Singapore, found in our freshwater swamp forest. Uh, and also some lizard species are found in Bukit Timah Hill as well. So uh, we've planted them all over Singapore. So sometimes when you drive along the roadsides and go along, uh, go to some of our parks, you see this tree with very nice small pink flowers that actually line the whole branch or the whole canopy of the tree. That's the main part. And many of these Singaporeans, uh, many of these trees, Singaporeans have not realized that they are native to us, and we do have very nice things from forests, which we are gradually propagating and also introducing to uh, the public areas for people to appreciate them as well. Will our audience get to plant one of these trees that you have propagated? Very highly likely. Uh, so if uh, if you join us for our OMT planting. Uh, uh, there are many of these trees, and some, even some of these trees that Zaki have shared are uh, also in the planting list for certain areas. So if you, uh, if you want, you can join us for our OMT planting. Do take part in some of these uh, activities that uh, we have lined up. Yeah, and you might get a chance to plant some of these. All right. Um, thank you very much uh, for entertaining the questions and uh, giving such wonderful response. Uh, with that, I would like to um, end the session. Um, thank you, Wifang and Zaki, for giving us such an interesting look at what is usually behind the scenes operations. Also, a million thanks to our audience on Zoom and YouTube for joining us today. The One Million Trees movement is growing strong, just like all the saplings that Wifang and Zaki have entrusted to us. So do look out for our updates on our website, trees.sg, and also connect with us on MPAC social media. For our next webinar, we are going big we'll be uncovering what goes on underneath the huge majestic canopies of forest. Dr. Sean Lam and Mr. Loa Hock Kiong will be sharing with us insights into the dynamic field of forest research. Thank you everyone for attending this session. We hope you have a great evening and also a delightful Dupa Bali. Bye.